Okay, good afternoon everyone and a very warm welcome to the first session of the British Council Study UK Smart Talk webinar series for 2021. Our Smart Talk webinar series is sponsored by Qatar Airways, a multi award winning airline recently announced as the airline of the year by the international air transport rating organization Skytrax for the sixth time previously won in 2011, 12, 15, 17, 19 and now 2021. The airline also won five additional awards, including the world's best business class in airline lounge, airline seats, onboard catering and best airline in the Middle East. Powered by Qatar Airways Privilege Club, Qatar Airways exclusive student club program is dedicated to offering you unparalleled opportunities, savings and more so you can aim for the skies throughout your educational journey. Fly to more than 140 destinations worldwide with Qatar Airways and enjoy 1,500 bonus Q miles upon enrolment to the Qatar Airways Student Club with promo code BCSC21 to enjoy. You can sign up to these exclusive offers and find out more by visiting their student club page, which will shortly be appearing in your chat box. And we'll now watch a short video on Qatar Airways before we get started. As you pursue your education, let us be part of your journey, offering you exclusive benefits designed with your travel needs in mind. Experience a journey where comfort meets impeccable service and where you can stay connected with complimentary super Wi-Fi. Explore a world just waiting to be discovered. With special fares and more, you can share the memorable milestones along the way and enjoy a Privilege Club tier upgrade as a graduation gift, plus the flexibility you need to change your plans and travel when it suits you. Welcome to our Student Club. Join today and aim for the skies. Let's go further together. As countries around the globe are slowly, we hope, returning to normal and for anyone about to embark on your student journey in the near future, fly with the world's best airline of the year, Qatar Airways, if you're returning back to campus in the United Kingdom. So welcome everyone. I hope you're all well and looking forward to today's smart talk. I certainly am. My name is Fraser and I work for the British Council's education team in East Asia and I'll be your host for today's smart talk. Just before we start, a quick bit of housekeeping. The session is being recorded and we will share across the British Council social media channels afterwards. So you can share with your friends and catch up later on the best bits. If you submitted a question during registration, thank you very much. And we have incorporated these into the session where we can. If you have a question during the session, you can post it in the Q&A box and I will do my best to ask them. And if you have any comments, you can also put them in the chat box to speak to the team if you need to. And finally, for the best webinar experience, we recommend you maximize your device screen. So without further ado, we will begin today's smart talk. So our guest today has contributed significant strides in both medicine and women's empowerment. She's a general surgeon and a clinical research fellow at Imperial College London. Her research has been presented at international conferences and published in some of the most high impact journals in medicine. In her spare time, she shares educational content on public health on her social media, where she has amassed a huge following. I'm sure some of you today. She's also garnered multiple accolades from the Ministry of Youth and Sports Malaysia, Tapla, Asians Gen T Leader of Tomorrow, and even the King of Malaysia. So allow me to give a warm welcome to our very special guest today, Dr. Amelina Bakri. Welcome, Dr. Amelina. And I suppose first things first, how are you? I am very good. Very, thank you very much, Fraser. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me today. I am very um, you know, happy and privileged to be here, um, you know, discussing about my education journey and career in the UK. Brilliant. Yes, we've got a lot to get through and you've certainly had an amazing journey. And so, as, as you said, we're going to be taking a bit of a deep dive into your, your educational background and, and your career as well over the next hour or so. But I thought before we dive into all of that, um, we've all had an exceptional 18 months, it's fair to say, and I imagine for someone in the medical profession, it's it's not been easy. So I wonder if you could just give a bit of a, 
an intro to, to what you've been up to in the last 18 months and, and how you've fared during the pandemic. Oh, uh, I mean, it's been um, crazy busy. Um, I mean, I can talk hours and hours about the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but essentially, um, you know, during the first wave um, in the UK, um, you know, as you probably know, um, you know, we had thousands and thousands of cases and I was doing, you know, three 24-hour shifts a week uh, looking after COVID patients. Um, my specialty is general surgery, um, but because, you know, we didn't have enough staff and a lot of doctors from different specialties uh, were redeployed um, to look after COVID patients as well. So when I'm not doing my normal job as a general surgeon, then I will be helping out in COVID wards and also in ITU. So it was, um, you know, very overwhelming. You know, no one knew how to to treat the patients uh, when it first started. We did, we knew nothing about how to manage the disease, and um, so I was, you know, mentally and physically exhausted. Um, you know, throughout the whole months um, during the first wave, um, you know, seeing patients um, dying in front of you every day. Um, you know, it was it was very tough, um, and it did, um, you know, took a great toll on, on my mental health as well. Um, but you know, um, throughout the time, you know. It, even though we, we face a lot of difficult challenges, but you also learn a, a lot of great things about the COVID-19 pandemic as well. So when I wasn't working in the hospital, um, then I was involved in um, the vaccine trials. So the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine trials, where I was part of the research team uh, recruiting healthy volunteers for the, um, the trial in up phase one, phase two uh, of the study. Um, and also I have been working with um, the NHS and Public Health of England, um, the Sam Downing Street, um, the UN um, to fight misinformation about the COVID vaccines. And um, so it was, you know, amazing to be invited to go to the UK Prime Minister's office, you know, went to Sam Downing Street and did, um, you know, Q&A sessions with members of the public um, and just, you know, um, creating awareness about the vaccines. As you probably know, there are just lots of misinformation out there about COVID in general and about the vaccine. So it is important for a healthcare professional to, um, you know, relay correct information to the public to make sure that people understand and, and know the truth um, about the vaccines and the science behind it. Um, and now the situation is in the UK is a lot better. Um, you know, I'm back to doing my normal job as a surgeon and I'm now back to doing my PhD. So I'm currently doing my PhD in uh, surgical innovation and breast cancer surgery at Imperial. Um, and so, yeah, so I mean, the vaccination rate in the UK now is, is very, very good. Um, I think we have vaccinated about 80% um, of the uh, uh, UK population above uh, at the age of 12 years old um, of both doses and about 85% uh, want, received one dose at least. Um, so the um, situation in the UK now, um, you know, we are uh, learning how to live with the virus. You know, everything is um, sort of back to normal now. Um, you know, people are doing the usual things. Uh, all shops are open. People are allowed to travel now um, because you probably know, you know, the COVID um, virus will be with us for quite a while. So um, the approach that the UK government is taking now is to um, learn how to live the virus to be aware and to still, you know, um, be vigilant about um, the virus. But at the same time, we just have to know how to, li to live with it. Well, well, it sounds like you've had an incredibly busy 18 months. And I think I said in the introduction that you had some spare time, but I'm, I'm not sure I'm amazed you ever do. Um, but I, I would like to say, um, you know, a big thank you. I think we owe a lot to our to our doctors um, for, for the work you've done on, on the vaccine, but also looking after people. So thank you very much. Um, and I suppose that leads on quite nicely to to an opening question about your education, really. Um, and that's really sort of why why did you decide um, to, to become a doctor? Uh, was there a sort of a moment, that, an epiphany or, or was it a longer term plan? Yes, as far as I can remember, um, you know, I've always wanted to become a doctor uh, since I was a child. Uh, at the time, you know, I didn't really know what specialty I wanted to do. Um, but my mom said to me that uh, when I was a little girl, um, I like, um, you know, reading anatomy books. You know, she would buy me lots of books about um, doctors, um, you know, learning about the anatomy uh, of human bodies. Um, and, you know, I would play with stethoscopes um, and I would pretend to be a doctor. So I've always, you know, 
as far as I can remember, I've always wanted to become a doctor. I knew that I wanted to help people and make a difference. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and that's the reason why I decided to pursue medicine. And and now I'm here doing what I, I you know, um, I'm doing my, you know, following my dreams, basically. That's brilliant. And so we've got a, a lot of students on the line or people who are considering sort of their careers at the moment. So how did you then, you obviously studied it in the UK, how did you begin to make those plans and, and make those decisions and, and decide where to study? So, um, as you probably know, uh, my journey started after my SBM, uh, which is equivalent to GCSE exams in the UK. So, um, so after my SBM, so I got 17 eggs uh, in my exam and I uh, was awarded a special scholarship, Kijang Mas scholarship from the Central Bank of Malaysia um, to further my studies in the UK. So I actually, um, I went to the British Council in KL um, to discuss about potential schools, you know, for my A-levels and universities to study medicine. So at the time, um, I already made my mind up um, that I wanted to go to the UK and, and it's my, you know, place of choice, destination to further my studies. And, you know, I spoke to one of the advisors in British Council looking into different options. Um, uh, first of all, to do my A level. So I was looking to so many different boarding schools um, in the UK. And at the end, um, I decided to go to Cheltenham Ladies College. Um, I visited the school as well as, um, you know, we had to do uh, an entrance examination. Um, and yeah, and then so then I went to Cheltenham Ladies College for my A levels. Um, and then, you know, just deciding between, you know, what universities that I wanted to go to. I think the reason why I chose the UK was mainly um, because the UK have, you know, many world renowned universities and, you know, rank among the best in, in the world and you will get a very high quality education uh, without any doubt. Um, particularly for medicine. So I went to Edinburgh, I went to Cambridge, and now I'm in Imperial. So they're all um, they're very, very highly ranked universities in the world. Um, and I think international students are always very welcomed in the UK. You know, you don't feel out of place because there are just so many different communities um, and it's just a very diverse um, community. And, you know, there's so many, you know, if you're a Malaysian, there's just so many Malaysians in the UK um, as well. So you, you will not feel out of place and at the same time you'll get to know a lot of uh, many different people from all over the world. Uh, you get to learn different cultures um, from students, um, you know, international other international students as well as local students. Um, for example, in London, you know, you can find a variety of food, including Indian, Chinese, Malaysian, African, Caribbean, Moroccan, Italian, just, just endless options. Um, and and yeah, it's, it's amazing just to be here. And it's also an interesting place to live in. You know, there's just so much to do, you know, from the big city in London um, where you can visit museums, you know, going to theatres, you know, go for a walk in the Royal Parks uh, or visit historical landmarks um, and also visiting the countryside like in Scotland or even, you know, in the countryside in England. And my husband is from Wiltshire, so we, we normally go there. Um, over the weekends to visit his family. So it's just very nice to have that combination of, you know, big city centres where there's just so much to do. And you can also go to the countryside, go for a long walk um, and just enjoy the, um, you know, the nature. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's just, it's just a, a very beautiful place to live in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're making me miss my home. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to, so you obviously, you were at Cheltenham Ladies and I, I, I imagine they gave you some help in choosing a, a university, but what when you were choosing your undergrad university, what, what were you looking for? There's obviously a lot of focus on things like rankings um, yeah. that they tend to come in, but yeah, I suppose you knew what subject you wanted, but what, what were the sort of decision factors? Because there are a number of places you can study medicine, right. so what helped yes. you choose? Yeah, so, right, so ranking is, is uh, one, uh, uh, you know, uh, factor. Uh, and obviously, I think where, where you want to live, which city do you want to live in? So I basically went to visit, um, you know, so many different cities in the UK um, and London, um, you know, um, Edinburgh, Manchester, Bristol, Cambridge, Oxford um, and a few other cities. And, um, you know, they, they all have open days where you can go to and visit the universities and speak to the advisors there and speak to the students. And then I just fell in love with Edinburgh. Um, it's, it's such a beautiful city. And um, 
I mean, when I, you know, I, I, I got into a bus, uh, I arrived from my school, you know, from my school um, in um, Tottenham, arrived in, in, in Edinburgh. The first thing that I saw was the um, the train station, the Edinburgh Waverley train station. And then you, you saw the, um, the the city centre and it's just it's just very amazing and beautiful in the historical buildings. And I just I just fell in love with it. And then I went to visit the university and in Edinburgh um, when I applied was you know in the top three um, you know medical schools in the UK. Um, so I just went and decided to just go to Edinburgh University for to study medicine. Awesome. Yeah, Edinburgh's a really great city. Yeah. Um, and so what was the what was the experience like as a as a med, medical student? I mean, I certainly remember uh, that the medical students were always the busiest, uh, um, busiest on campus. So how, how was the experience and sort of the balance of practical versus sort of the, the theory and that type of thing? Yeah, I mean, um, medical school time, you know, it was intense, um, as you probably know, you know, you know, I suppose we had a, you know, a lot of lectures, but at the same time, we also had to go to do placements in the hospitals as well. So um, in the first two years um, was mainly, um, you know, basic science that so you learn about, um, you know, different uh, aspects of science, uh, human bodies, uh, anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, everything about everything that you needed to know about medicine. Um, and then after that, um, in the third year, then that's when you apply your knowledge uh, in, you know, in medical practice. And so then you started doing rotations in different hospitals. So moving around different hospitals as well. So in Edinburgh, um, you could be in any parts, uh, even outside of Edinburgh as well. So I had um, at one point um, did a rotation uh, in Borders General Hospital, which is in the border between Edinburgh and England, uh, sorry, um, Scotland and England. Um, so you know, it could be really far away um, in the middle of nowhere uh, during your placement or rotation. Um, so it was, um, you know, it was really busy. Um, um, and but at the same time, you also had, the, you know, more time to, you know, socialise as well. Um, and I've had lots of different activities, you know, I was involved in lots of different societies, um, you know, um, and especially I, I love uh, performing. So when I was at uni, I was part of um, a musical theatre. So I was performing uh, in, a, in a medical music, um, in a, a medical uh, theatre um, uh, as part of our fourth year programme where we had, um, you know, um, uh, we call it med medics musical um so then we perform in front of um of everyone um on stage um and also being part of lots of different other societies as well and just being engaged um with um you know what was happening in edinburgh uh, at the time but yeah it's, it's it's a very fun time for me um despite being busy but also at the same time i enjoyed uh, myself um you know during the time at uni yeah it sounds like you you really made the most of it <laughs> um, we've had a question um, about the sort of outside of what you learned on your studies. What what were some of the sort of biggest skills or lessons you you learned during your during your education that maybe helped you prepare for for moving yeah. into working life? I think um, I think one important lesson that I learned is to uh, be myself. I think. Um, being in the UK, I have been able to express who I really am. Uh, you know, as some of you probably know, you know, I can be quite outspoken in topics that I'm passionate about, such as women empowerment, you know, fighting medical misinformation. And um, so this is, I think, a behaviour that has been fostered here in the UK. You know, everyone is able to express their own opinions um, and, you know, be outsp outs outspoken. So I think um, that's one of the important lessons that I learned from my journey here being in the UK is to, to not be afraid and to, you know, express your opinion. Um, and also to embrace and celebrate diversity uh, and respect other people's choices, boundaries and beliefs as, you know, we have a very, you know, we live in a multicultural environment here in the UK, especially in London, um, you know, where you have so many different communities and just being in that community and being able to, um, you know, um, engage and uh, learn about other people's cultures and beliefs. I think um, it's, yeah, it's, it's just amazing. Brilliant. Yeah, I think I'd love to, I'm going to come on to a little bit about your uh, the, the fighting misinformation and things in a bit. I wondered just on the education side, if you could give a, a bit of a um, 
insight into sort of your decisions after Edinburgh and, and around your master's and PhD? How, do, how did you make those plans? Yeah, I think, um, you know, definitely having studied in, you know, top universities in the UK, um, I had, you know, many opportunities to do research and also working with, um, you know, top consultants in their field. And it definitely helped me with my, um, you know, where giving me the directions where I wanted to go and also help me with my job applications and, and um, you know, for pursuing my career in the UK. Um, and I think, you know, I learned not only how to become a good, good doctor, but also the skills on how to survive during my working life. So, um, so having that sort of support um, and guidance um, from, um, you know, top uh, world-renowned uh, consultant surgeons um, in the place where I went to study, either Edinburgh or Cambridge or Imperial. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's just really helpful um, and to guide me towards uh, what, what I should be doing, what I would want to do and uh, where, um, you know, where in my career path that I wanted to pursue uh, in, 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 my, in my career in surgery as well as in medicine. And I wanted to ask, because I did notice, um, obviously we're, we're Study UK, the British Council, but I noticed you, you did head over to Harvard for a little bit, is that right? Yes, yes, I did. Um, so that was during my, just after I finished my medical school and I did an internship in Harvard. Um, so, um, yeah, so, I mean, I applied um, to do my internship there. So I was, at the time, I was trying to think, I was trying to decide uh, whether I wanted to, um, you know, further my career in the UK or the US. Mm. And so I think uh, at, at the time, the best way for me to find out, um, you know, how is it going to be like if I, I did work in the in the US is to do an internship there. And I did. And so I went to Harvard. I was working in Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston um, in surgery and surgical oncology. Um, and, you know, I spent, um, you know, work, working in, in that hospital and I was working um, really hard. Um, I mean, as you probably know, the US, um, the um, shifts um, in the US as, as a general surgery resident or as, as a resident is very, very tough. Um, it's the same in the UK as well, but um, the hours in the US is a lot longer. Um, you know, you work 90 to 100 hours a week and you probably be doing um, 40 hour shifts every alternate weekend. So that's the time when I was I was there. I think they're probably a lot better now. They probably reduce the amount of hours that um, doctors should be working. But at the time, uh, it was, you know, it was very, very um, challenging. Um, and then I, I missed the UK as well. And, and um, so then I decided to go back to the UK and, um, you know, pursue my, my career in the UK instead and do surgery in the UK. But, you know, I was thinking about possibly working in the US. Um, but, you know, I, I decided to the best place for me to be in is actually the UK and not the US. Interesting. It's, it's great that you sort of had that experience and were able to, to compare the two. Yeah. Um, and so you're currently uh, your general surgeon at Imperial College, but you're also doing a PhD. Is that? Yeah. Is, so how, what does the sort of day in the life look like? How do you balance that study alongside the, the being a surgeon? Yeah, so um, I mean, I think it's about time management um, and planning, really. So I don't really have a typical working day. So my day, you know, varies according to my, um, you know, clinical shifts as a surgeon and my, my academic commitments uh, as, you know, doing a PhD and also um, teaching as well. I have um, teaching commitments uh, with medical students and supervising uh, BSc and master's students at the same time. So it all depends on my um, clinical rota and, um, you know, patient recruitment for my PhD. So, um, you know, I can be doing, I can be in theatre all day one day or the next day I can be in the hospital recruiting patients for my PhD trials. So, for me, it's about time management and planning and being able to meet with deadlines. So there is always, you know, too, so much to do. So it is important um, to identify um, the important and urgent task. Uh, it's also important to know uh, when to take a break as well. So, um, you know, as you probably know, you know, it will be a never ending um, work and, and you will never know when to stop. So it is 
important to always um, set, uh, you know, um, set aside uh, some time for you to have a break um, to maintain you know, productivity in the long run. And always make sure that I plan my days, you know, months in advance um, and have it on my Google calendar. I you know um, also use uh, Microsoft timeline to plan my PhD work so that I could meet the deadline. So I've got a few deadlines coming up in November, December. So I've got them on, on my schedule and making sure that I'm, I'm going to meet their deadlines, you know, publishing papers and things like that. And um, with social media, um, so that is something that I do, um, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm free. So normally I would limit my time on it, you know, by setting the time limit on the app. Um, you know, I'll probably spend about um, maximum an hour per day um, to make sure that I don't really waste my time, you know, scrolling on social media apps for hours and hours. So it's all about really time management and being able to say no when you need to say no and knowing when to take a break when you do need to take a break. Brilliant. Thanks, Emily. That's really helpful advice, I'm sure, for all our aspiring doctors. Um, and so I had a question around your social media because um, you mentioned this is, I suppose, a hobby or something you're doing in spare time. And, and I had a look, I popped on Instagram, I think you've got over 800,000 followers, so it's, it's quite an impressive hobby. Um, <laughs> what, how did it come about? And what's your aim for it? And, and yeah. sort of you give a bit of a, a few thoughts on that. Yes, yeah, so um, so the story behind my social media was um, so basically when I was um, a few years ago, uh, one of my bosses, consultant surgeons, uh, basically asked me to uh, create a Twitter account. Um, and I decided I was a little bit reluctant because I didn't really want to be in the public eye and I just wanted to, you know, I just, I just want to do all of that. Um, and, but he convinced me because he wanted to tweet about me. <laughs> um, at the time we, there was, a, in, you know, there, there was a discussion about, um, you know, the NHS and how we have a lot of really wonderful doctors um, in the NHS from all over the world. And he, he wanted to tweet about me, the fact that I'm from Malaysia and I'm now currently working for the NHS and how, how proud he is um, with, you know, with me and um, me being his one of his trainees. And so, um, so he then, you know, I, I then created my Twitter account and he tweeted about it. Um, and then I think some Malaysians probably, you know, recognize me from my previous, um, uh, you know, SPM um, record achievements. Um, and the next day, uh, the tweet became viral um, and um, some Malaysians probably found me on Twitter. And then the next day, I, you know, received thousands and thousands of um, following requests um, from Malaysians and um, so then I uh, you know initially I wanted to just deactivate it um, but then I thought maybe it's a good idea to use that platform to you know to teach and to create awareness and doing public health education so then I just started um, reading a lot um, writing a lot of tweets and um, threads about um, you know whatever medical um, topics that I'm passionate about um, and uh, teaching as well, medical students and then I then moved on to Instagram and then yeah, and all, it all started from there. And, and now I, you know, I do a lot of um, sessions depending on the topics. Now currently I'm focusing on women's health. So um, educating, making videos, you know, very short videos about, um, you know, women's health in general just to try to educate and discuss about, you know, taboo topics that people don't normally talk about um, and creating awareness about sexual education, um, you know, in terms of um, from anatomy, from medical perspective. So it's just, um, I think it's very important for us to have that discussion. So I just wanted to use social media as a platform to reach out to people because I know that, you know, social media is you know a very important aspect of people's lives now um and you know lots of people use social media and it's just it's very easy to reach out to people especially the younger generation and to create awareness um and yes and also to um you know i'm very passionate about women empowerment so um being able to inspire other you know young people young generations to do what i am doing now is, is just something that I, I love doing. Brilliant. I think it's it's a really powerful message and it's also great to see 
uh, how proud Malaysians are of, of what you're doing as well. Um, I suppose the double-edged sword of social media, something you touched on earlier, is that there's obviously fake news and a lot of misinformation. Um, and I know you do a lot of work around try, trying to sort of not solve it, but, but share positive and correct information. And as, uh, there we had a really good question in the chat sort of saying, you know, what, what can be done about this? And, and what, what steps can you take in the NHS and, and people take to, to try and help on this? Because social media is obviously a very powerful tool both ways. Yeah, yeah, you know, you're right. I mean, um, when I, um, you know, fight misinformation on social media, I typically will, um, you know, have that sort of honest conversation with people and um, try to understand what is their problem, what's the concern, what's making them believe, you know, believing this sort of news or fake news. Um, and then having that um, discussion. So I, I do a lot of different different things. So for example, doing Q&A sessions um, on Instagram, um, whereby, you know, I would um, ask, um, you know, my followers to ask questions about something that they're concerned about or worried about, something they're not sure about. And then I'll just have that discussion and, and explaining to them in a you know, based on evidence-based medicine and also um, explaining to them in a, a you know, um, in a, so a way that people can understand. Yeah. And also um, doing, um, you know, just making like short videos, short fun videos. Um, now I've, I've just, I've created a TikTok account um, a few months ago because um, I know that young people like to use TikTok. And so now I would, you know, make short videos and, and just discuss about, you know, certain topics um, and just trying to, um, you know, reach out to this audience and 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 just try to do it in, in a fun way. You know, I think it's important for healthcare professionals to be able to engage with the public because, you know, we live in, in a very connected world now. And I know, you know, um, sometimes some healthcare professionals are probably a bit reluctant to be on social media, which I totally understand because there are, negativities associated with it you know apart from you know as you mentioned the misinformation but also being a public figure on social media is something that is um very challenging because you will get a lot of trolls hate messages um you know any um you know you name it so it's it's it's, it's very difficult i mean i've experienced that myself you know cyberbullying, trolling, hate messages that I receive on social media. But I think um, it is a, it's a matter of knowing how to deal with it. And I know at the beginning when I first started using social media, you know, I got very upset with, you know, all the messages I was getting at the time. But I think as the years went on and I, you know, sort of, I, I learned how to deal with it. Um, and, and I think it's important to look after your mental health as well. So knowing how to deal with all that negativities and knowing to just ignore and not, you know, being absorbed into that sort of um, negativities and just trying to um, channel a positive energy by just continuing what you're doing. Because I know that I'm doing a good thing to people, which is, you know, creating um awareness and teaching people and and um so i feel that i need to do what i'm doing now and continue doing what i'm doing now to make sure that um we can fight all this misinformation online brilliant no i think yeah. it's it's really important and i think it takes a certain type of bravery to put yourself out there on on social media so um and i hope uh, people listening today do do drop you a follow and uh, and I've had a look and I know there's some great stuff out there. Great to hear you've got TikTok as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wanted to also touch on um, you talk very passionately about women's empowerment and I'm sure we've got lots of young women on, on the line today who are possibly thinking about international education and, and what they want to do in the future. And I wonder if you, you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, that that side of things and, and what you're doing in that space but also any, any advice and, and, and lessons learned from your side as well yes yeah, so um my aim um you know in my social media right now is to encourage more women to enter surgery so um you know based on the recent data uh, in 2020 um there are only 13 percent uh, female consultant surgeons um in the uk um, so the proportions of both, you know, female consultants and trainees, you know, are increasing um, steadily. 
uh, at a similar rate, uh, but there remains you know, a large gap between the numbers of women who go into training and also those who become consultants. So I think um, you know, representation is important and that's the reason why you know, I put myself out there on social media um, so that I could create awareness about women empowerment and how you know, life as a woman in surgery or medicine is like and just encouraging girls and young women to follow their dreams. Um, and I think some of the problems um, that we suffer today um, are, you know, consequences of the decisions that we made, you know, at an early age, you know, mm -hmm. due to lack of, um, you know, proper guidance or advice uh, from people around you or, you know, just in general. So I believe that, you know, everyone has the potential, um, no matter no matter where they come from, um, you know, you know, they just need a proper guidance and the right advice um, and that sort of role model and, um, you know, someone that they can look up to and relate to. So that's the reason why uh, what I'm doing, what I'm doing now um, is just to encourage and inspire more young generations, particularly young girls and women um, to do medicine and to enter surgery or in any, any kind of specialties that doesn't have to be surgery and to just follow their dreams um and and to believe in themselves um and yeah brilliant thanks i mean i think the key there that you said is about being able to relate to people i think and so you know it's great that, that you're doing that and i hope this smart talk goes some way to inspiring someone someone out there um we've had some really good questions from the audience some are some are specific some are more general uh, around um life in the uk i mean a very general one we had is could you talk about some of the similarities and differences between living in the UK and Malaysia and how you adapted to, to moving to the UK, which I think is a good place to start? Yeah, um, I think that's a difficult question to answer. It's definitely um, very different living um, in the UK compared to, the, to living in Malaysia. Um, of course, there are um, some similarities, I would say, probably in terms of work ethics. You know, people work very hard in both countries and, you know, the importance of family. I think, um, you know, Malaysians are very family orientated. You know, they, they love the families very much and, and also the UK, very, very similar. And, you know, people just wanting to um, uh, improve their lives and just work hard and, and be the best that they can. And of course, um, you know, as I mentioned previously, um, London is incredibly multicultural and so it's easy to find other Malaysians here and go out for some, you know, delicious Malaysian food. Um, you know, there's just so many amazing Malaysian restaurants in London. So you just you, you just feel that you're at home, even if you're um, in the UK and there's just so many Malaysians, so many Malaysian Malaysian food as well. So you can eat nasi lemak whenever you want. So that's not really um, difficult. In terms of um, differences, um, I think the weather, um, you know, the UK is a lot colder, uh, as you probably know, over the winter especially. Um, but summer, su summer is very, very nice when it's sunny, but when it's not sunny, it's not, it's not nice at all. <laughs> it will be rainy most of the time. And um, UK has a lot of uh, green space where you can go for a walk. So in London, we have a lot of um, royal parks. So I typically over the weekends, um, you know, I love going for a walk with my husband in the park um, and just, you know, have that fresh air and just enjoy the nature and then just go back to the city again and then go back to the the, the green spaces. It's just a lot of things to do. Um, and also uh, living in the UK, obviously, obviously I miss my mom and my family. Um, so since the pandemic started, I've not been able to see my mom at all. So um, I would love to go back home very soon, um, you know, when inter international travelling is allowed because my, my my husband currently can't go in. So I just, I'm just waiting for the time where um, when we both can um, you know, travel to Malaysia at the same time so that we can meet uh, my family. and. As I mentioned, even though we can get Malaysian food here in London, but um, nothing beats my mom's amazing spicy chicken, uh, which is my favourite. So, yeah, so I miss that a lot too. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's just a few things that you really miss about home. And it's just it's just nice to be able to go home uh, when you need to. Yeah, I, I completely agree. There's nothing like some home-cooked food. Yeah. Um, and we had a, so I suppose following on from that, um, in terms of international students specifically, we've had a question asking for sort of any advice for 
for those preparing to head to, to the UK for the first time. Um, mm -hmm. But also any, they've, they've said any stigmas or anything to be aware of as an international student arriving uh, and, and that type of thing. Yeah, so I think in terms of preparation, um, I think there's just so many different um, sources that you can, um, you know, look at online. Um, so many different websites. I think British Council website has, you know, very good um, summary about, um, you know, preparation before you go to the UK. And also, um, you know, speaking to people who who are currently studying in the UK or um, who have, you know, been, um, who had, you know, spent some time in the UK and now working in Malaysia. So I think um, just just having a chat with those people and and um, understanding uh, the place that where you're going to, and of course you have to prepare all this, you know, um, winter clothing, making sure that you have enough um, clothes for the winter time because um, it's going to be really cool here. It depends on where you go as well. Scotland is going to be really, really cool out there. Um, in London, probably slightly warmer. Uh, but yes, I think um, having done preparation, doing, you know, some search online um, to understand, um, you know, the situation in the UK and also where you're, you're going, the specific location, every, every, you know, different cities are a little bit different. Um, and in terms of um, stereotypes, so yeah, that, that is a difficult question. So I think what you should just do is just be yourself and, you know, and mingle around with people um, and just don't stay in, you know, one, um, you know, if you're from Malaysia, just don't stay just within your own Malaysian community, but make sure that you, um, you know, socialize uh, with people from all over the world. There's just so many different people um, in the UK and uh, universities. And this is your opportunity to learn about other people's culture, religion, beliefs, a way of living. So, um, you know, I would say um, try to embrace diversity and learn about, you know, uh, whatever that you can learn about other people's culture and differences. Um, and yes, try to assimilate yourself with the new environment. Uh, and get involved in, um, you know, different societies uh, you, that you're interested in. Um, you know, don't just stay in your room, you know, read books and study all the time, but making sure that you also have some time to um, socialize and meet new people and go out with your friends. Um, there are lots of, there are so many different activities that you can do. Um, yeah, I think hopefully then you'll enjoy your time in the UK and yes, and you'll be prepared for your uh, working life. Awesome. I think that's some brilliant advice. And, and I think you touched on that universities have a lot of social clubs and activities to sort of help and open days and things at the start of term when students can go and, and try and get involved in as many things as possible. Um, so I'm going to come on to a few more specific questions about uh, sort of medicine in the UK and becoming a doctor. So we've had a question about pathways of entry into paediatrics and neurosurgeon training. And are you allowed to choose the region that you want to work in in the UK? So I think a, a little bit about pathways into specialising and then how does it work in terms of where you go? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So um, in order to work in the UK, uh, you need to get a GMC licence to practice. So that's a general medical council. So you need to do a PLAB exam. So that's a uh, kind of exams like an entrance exam uh, and an English test as well so that's normally IELTS and uh, you know fill in various forms in order to get your license to practice so once you get that license to practice then you can work in the UK so you should look at um, GMC and NHS recruitment websites for further details about how to apply for that GMC license. Um, in terms of uh, getting into training in the UK um, so you need to apply to a national recruitment program. So similar to the matching program in the US uh, where you will have, you know, an interview with multiple stations, similar to sort of OSCE scenario, if you, if you are, you know, I'm sure you understand what OSCE is. And you'll then be ranked uh, nationally um, in the UK. Um, so and then they will consider whether you are for the job or not. So, um, so your region will of work um, will depend on your ranking. So if you rank high, then you get to go to your first choice uh, region. So when you apply, uh, so once you apply for your job, then, then you need to rank which region you would like to go to. So if you rank high, 
you know, you get to work in your first choice region. For example, um, places like London, um, Edinburgh, Oxford, Cambridge, you know, they are very competitive. So you need to be in the top first percentiles um, if you want to go to all these places um, to work in. Um, in terms of um, I think someone asked about um, you know, completing uh, their training in Malaysia, but if they want to work in the UK, then what they need to do. So um, I think even though you have completed your training in Malaysia, you need to provide evidence that your training uh, is up to the UK standard. So many clinicians uh, from abroad um, need to do extra training in the UK to qualify for specialist registration. So it depends on you know, what evidence you can provide. Um, and you can look into CESR route um, and the decision will be made, you know, based on individual basis. So you should contact the Royal Colleges of your specialties for advice and they will be able to let you know what sort of evidence that you need to provide. And if you need to do extra training in the UK, uh, which typically you need to normally you need to, even though you've completed your training elsewhere, because there are just differences in terms of the system and the pathway. And then they just need to make sure that you are, you know, um, you know being trained in a similar way um, and, and understand the system in the UK as well. So yeah, hopefully then um, if you are applying, then I wish you all the best um, and, and just have a look at all these websites that I mentioned, the NHS website and also the GMC license, um, GMC website and the Royal Colleges website as well. Great, thanks Dr. Amelina. Someone has asked specifically about the, the PLAB, I think the Professional and Linguistics Assessment Board. Um, mm -hmm. And I think whether you can say anything on that and the, the English exam and that type of thing. I know you've covered a little bit of it there, but if there's anything else to, to mention on that. Um, you mean the PLAB exam or yeah. which one is yeah. the PLAB exam? Um, so I don't really know much about the PLAB exam because I uh, I've, I, I didn't have to take it because I'm, I'm a UK graduate, so I really don't know much about it. But um, the best thing for you to do is to have a look on their website and um, just different various things that they need to they need to assess you on, but mainly on your English skills and understanding the NHS and the UK system um, and, and to make sure that you're, you know, you'll be prepared um, to be a doctor in the UK. OK, great. Thank you. I'm sure people will be able to, to find that on the website. Um, and so just I suppose it'd be interesting to I don't think we've touched on yet on how you decided to specialise you know, sort of choose your specialism and how did your thought process work on that I think that'd be interesting for people. Yes so um, so I was uh, before we started the session I was saying how I, I love um, watching Grey's Anatomy <laughs> when I was at university um, well it's, it's not the main reason why I went into surgery but one of the reasons you know just watching Grey's Anatomy it just made me really excited and just you know um, and, and I wanted to do surgery uh, because of it um, but I think the main reason why um, I went into surgery was because I really had a really good experience um, when I was doing my surgical rotations uh, as a medical student as well as a junior doctor so you Special in the UK, you you specialise after you finish your two years of foundation training, which is equivalent to housemanship in Malaysia. So after you finish medical school, you will do um, two years uh, as a foundation junior doctor, FY1, FY2, and then you then apply during your FY FY2 year um, to get into a specialty training. And your duration of your training, uh, you know, varies uh, depending on the specialty. So for surgery, um, it's very, very long um, and it's, it's the longest specialty. Um, so, so after finishing medical school, uh, you have to train for at least at least another 10 years um, but all depends as well on your um, you know whether you do a PhD or do a master's or you want to do any other extra degrees and then fellowship year so it all taking into account into consideration so at least it, it can be from about 10 to maybe 20 years depending on what you do and what specialty that you want to go into um, so, um, yeah, so I mean, now I'm currently doing my PhD um, and it is tough, um, you know, while also doing clinical work at the same time. But it is what it is, um, you know, um, 
and I think if you if you are a very motivated person and you know what your end goal is, um, you know, even though the job is hard, it's very challenging. I think um, you will go through it um, and with the support from your family your friends, um, having that social support network. And and I think, yes, um, anyone can do it um, and it, anything is possible. Brilliant, thank you. That's uh, I, I had no idea it took quite so long. <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed. <laughs> um, and we've had a good question actually about, um, so as you said, before you specialise, you, you sort of cover the whole range, particularly in the undergrad. And someone's asked, uh, were there any bits that you, you didn't like or didn't enjoy? And, and how do you, how do you sort of navigate and put effort into those bits you don't enjoy as much as the bits you do? Um, so in terms of things that I don't really enjoy at work, I think um, it's the long hours. <laughs> <laughs> which you, you can't really change, um, but uh, you can work around it. Um, as in, um, I think over the years, I mean, obviously when you first, you know, you, you finish your medical school, but when, when you're still at university anyways, you are, you know, being, you're going to be trained on how to deal with exhaustion and how to deal with, um, you know, lo long working hours. Um, and because you will be doing rotations, different placements um, in hospitals. But when when you start doing the job as a first year junior doctor, that's when everything starts. And it can be very, very exhausting and tiring, especially when you do very long working hours on calls. Um, so as an F1 or junior doctor, um, he could probably do it, be doing, you know, 13 hour shifts um, a row, like maybe three or four 13 hour shifts in a row. Uh, without any break um, and it can you know it can be very challenging um, not only physically but also mentally um, and I think uh, you know there is it's a lot of support available out there and and, and the NHS we have um, you know well-being uh, officer and advisor and places that you can go to to speak to if you have any issues but I think um, it's a matter of being able to um, and you know go through it and um, what what works for me is that I know what my end goal is this is where I want to, to be at and and going through all these different challenges um, and I know where I want to go I know what my end goal is and so I will just keep on pushing myself and going through all these challenges even though I know how difficult it is so the long hours is, is very very challenging for me um, and like I said, you know, being able to balance between social life, uh, family life, um, working life, academic life. And so um, time management is also important, but it is still very challenging for me because uh, having to decide, you know, what I need to, to do on that day. And, and probably um, I need to give up on doing something else that's important as well. So it's there, there's certain certain sacrifices that you need to do um, in order for you to move on or proceed in your life or your career, um, which you need to decide for yourself when you get to that point. Um, but I would, I would I don't want to scare anyone, but you know, um, it's, it's important to know and understand and to be realistic of expectations and know that you know um, it, it it is. Uh, you know, a difficult job. Um, it is difficult to, to be successful. Um, you know, it's not easy. Um, there's really no lift for you to just become, you know, the top in your career. So you have to really work hard for it. Uh, and but you, it will be worth it at the end. Thank you. I think that's really valuable advice, having having an end goal in mind and, and having that aim to, to. But it also sounds like you, you definitely need that support network as well. And I think you mentioned there's the sort of the professional support you can get, but also parents, friends, family and that type of thing as well. Yeah, I, I think without my mom, my husband, my family, my friends, I think I would never be where I am today. They are very, very supportive. And, you know, there will be days where I would come back from crying after, you know, a night shift, um, you know, and it's, it's difficult. And yeah. And I think, um, you know, I would just be on the phone with my mom or like talk to my husband, you know, I had a really bad day today, I just want to talk about it. So it's just about making sure that you are not going to be burnt out. So I think um, it, it is, you know, it's one of the things that could happen quite easily when you are burnt out and you will just give up and you just don't want to 
get back up again and you just don't want to do it ever again. But I think having that support network is, is very, very vital in order for you to um, continue what you're doing. Absolutely. And, and there's and I've no doubt there's some parents on the line today, so we'll give a big shout out to all the supportive parents. <laughs> um, I'm jumping around a little bit because we've got questions coming thick and fast. Someone wanted to pick up on the um, that you mentioned sort of housemanship and as an international student. And there's the question is really and you touched on it. sort of how how feasible is it, I suppose, for an international student to, to go through that process as an international student? You've obviously done it. Are there lots of examples? Is it? They're there say they're looking, they intend to do their undergraduate degree and then hopefully be based in the UK. So in um, terms of staying in the UK. Sure. Uh, so, um, I mean, I don't really have much experience with that because I am considered as a UK graduate. So I just I went through similar processes, the local UK grads. Um, but um, I think now um, there is such thing as because I think previously um, they have this rule saying that they will only consider um, UK and EU grads as a priority um, for housemanship or for specialist uh, training program. And then only if they don't have anyone that is suitable for that job, um, then they will consider international grads. I think after 2019, the rules um, have changed. If I'm not mistaken, uh, I'm not quite sure, but you probably want to check that. Um, and now everyone is, you know, everyone is in the same on the same uh, level um, playing field. Um, and so you, it's all it's all based on merit. So if you're good, then you're good, then you get the job. So in terms of housemanship, you have to apply again, similar to special training program. You have to apply nationally. And um, you then um, will be rank um, in in the whole in the country, um, and depending where you are in the ranking, then you get to to get to choose your first choice uh, region, um, and then you can get to choose your um, hospital of choice, where which rotation that you would like to do. But it all depends on your own merit. So you have to, you know, um, there is like a uh, ranking based score point thing that they do um you know you have to the, the different things that they look into sort of for example publications um you know how many presentations have you done um how many audits have you done teaching um and um you know commitment to um working in the uk for example so there's just lots of different things that you need to look um into and prepare for you need to like prepare a portfolio um, about your um, you know education journey and everything else, um, your your work experience. So all of that will take will be taken into consideration. So my adv advice is just so many different um, sources available online now. So my advice is just have a Google and um, have a look at what's needed for you to get into um, housemanship or specialty training in the UK as an international graduate. And then there will just be a lot of different resources available out there. Brilliant. Thanks, Dr. Amelina. And time has absolutely flown. So we've only got two minutes left. I think we've covered all the questions in the chat. And uh, thank you to everyone who has asked a question. And also just to say there's lots of positive comments coming through about how fantastic you are as well. <laughs> um, I suppose we can maybe end. Uh, you've given a, a lot of valuable advice um, today, but any sort of final advice for for students who are considering heading to the UK to study? So my advice is, uh, you know, would be just work hard. Um, I think it's really important. I think open up your mind and, you know, get up your comfort zone um, and, you know, set up your own goals in life. What is your end goal? What's the reason that you're here? Um, and, you know, just stay true to yourself and don't be afraid to challenge the st status quo. So if you if you think that something is wrong, um, you know, speak up and don't be afraid to uh, voice your opinion and always uh, have you know, a plan from A to Z uh, and, and just I think just never give up and um, just remember what your end goal is. And I think anyone can be successful um, if you put your heart and mind into it. So it's a matter of um, having that um, passion and perseverance and that motivation to um, be successful in whatever that you choose to do in your life. Brilliant. I think that's the, the perfect positive way to, to end today and it certainly left me feeling inspired. So 
unfortunately that is all we have time for today and we will have to bring the session to a close um, on behalf of, of British Council and Study UK just a huge thank you uh, Dr Amelina um, for, for everything all your contributions all your advice and, and guidance I mean it, it's been hugely inspiring just for me so I'm sure for all those on the line um, massively informative and we're really really grateful um, for, for your time today um, and I'd also like to thank our audience uh, thank you for, for joining us today and thank you for all your, your great questions as well really engaging yeah. and I hope you found it useful um, and just to flag that this is a series and it is ongoing so um, do stay tuned for our next smart talk uh, also sponsored by Qatar Airways that's happening uh, every Saturday at four o'clock uh, for the next few weeks um, and our next session is with an award-winning journalist Ian Yee so spread the word to, to all those you know who are looking to pursue education um, or career around public relations journalism and, and civil society and in the coming weeks we also have some sessions uh, future sessions in arts and environmental issues um, public affairs and administration as well uh, and I think there will be a link appearing in your chat box so uh, where you can register for all those sessions and finally if you do have any uh, questions or feedback on the session itself please don't hesitate to, to get in touch with us so a final thank you um, Dr Amelina I hope you've enjoyed the session as well um, wishing you all the best in your PhD and, and your surgery as, as you go ahead and, and thank you so much for today it's been, it's been brilliant so thank you very much thanks everyone